Shortly after the general election, the coalition government invited all schools, secondary, primary and special, to apply for academy status, with a special fast-track route for those already graded outstanding by Ofsted. The first of those schools to convert are now up and running. So how are they doing and how many more will follow in their footsteps? Watford Grammar School for Boys may look familiar. It's where the History Boys was filmed. And now this partially selective, voluntary-aided school is in the limelight again, as one of the 32 schools to convert to academy status in time for the start of the new academic year. So, Martin, you were one of the very first schools to convert uh, to academy and really did it over the summer. Was it a fantastically busy summer sorting us all out? We had a governor's meeting on the 10th of August, which... Um, decided that we would go full steam ahead. Probably took 10 weeks of, of really hard work over the summer. Um, and really, for six weeks of those, we were still not sure whether we were going to go or not. And what, for you, was the big motivation? Um, I think that the school has always wanted to be as independent as possible within the, the state sector. The financial uh, aspect has to be taken into account. Um, and although the local authority, Hertfordshire, uh, probably uh, top sliced less than most local authorities, um, there was still a substantial amount of money coming back to us, which I feel I could use better uh, than them. Can you give us some idea how much better off you are? It's about £380,000. I mean, obviously, we have to deduct from that the kind of things that we will be paying for. The Academy's bill became law within three months of the general election. After changes made in Parliament, the law allows schools that convert new freedoms to set their own curriculum, as long as it's broad and balanced, to administer their own admissions within the admissions code, to set pay and conditions for their staff, to change the length of the school day and term, and to receive their share of the money normally held back by councils for central services. Although mainly about granting new freedoms to schools, the Academies Act also imposes some constraints, requiring new academies to have at least two parent governors, to promote community cohesion with encouragement to support other schools, to appoint a special needs coordinator and to comply with obligations to meet pupils' special needs. Before the summer, we visited another outstanding school considering becoming an academy, this time a primary. At that time, the executive principal, Greg Wallace, who runs Woodbury as part of a federation with two other primary schools, was still unsure whether he'd go ahead. Uh, is it clear yet how much extra money you would get? No, no, it's not clear at all. I mean, we're all thinking 10%, but I have no idea. And finding out for definite how much money is important. It's now a few months later, and I've come back to ask Greg whether he has more information. Greg, when we uh, last met, you were still a bit uncertain about whether or not to go ahead with uh, applying for academy status. You still had some unanswered questions. Um, have things changed? Yeah, they've, they've moved on a lot. I think one of the things I was unsure about was um, VAT, what would happen there. I've now got an answer to that, we get the money back. I was unsure about what would happen to us as a federation. I'm now clear that all three schools can move forward to be academies together and I was unsure about how much money we'd get, and I'm now much clearer about that too. So how much extra money will you get? We'd get, um, for this school, would be down £250,000 extra, same for London Fields, more or less, and about 200000 for Mandeville. So between us, that would be three quarters of a million pounds extra per year. That's the thing that does really kind of um, drive us. Because Woodbury is part of a federation, it's able to share services across its three schools to save money. However, all schools becoming academies, including Greg's, will have to pay for educational psychologists and SEN services, behavioural support, HR and payroll services, and administrative support on admissions. Going back to, to funding, what will you be doing with that extra money? Well, I, I think that... It's, it's no secret that we're moving into a time of, of real financial turbulence and, and I'm working on the basis that um, my budget will be reduced or we are going to reduce the budget by, by 10%. So that will be roughly £500,000 
uh, coming out of the budget next year. Now, obviously, the, 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 the money, that, the resources that we have that used to go to the local authorities will, to some extent, uh, help us to meet that, that cut. It doesn't mean that we're going to be gold-plating the taps or anything like that, but it does mean that, that we perhaps are not going to be forced into some of the extreme measures that, that some other schools would have to uh, contemplate. A big question for school staff is what will happen to pay and conditions as academies have freedom to vary these. In the early days, the academies will probably try to increase teachers' pay in very specific areas. So they need a good head of maths, and they know there's a good head of maths in a school down the road, so they will offer him um, the teachers T TLR plus. And so there will be a kind of Premier League type of poaching of the best teachers and the best deputy heads and so on. If all schools or a majority of secondary schools go down that route, I suspect relatively little in practice will actually change. But it may be that there will be some things like pay and conditions of service that will cease to be national and that in some parts of the country will end up with a much lower paid staff because costs are lower out in, in some areas than they are in, in, in the centre. However, there are constraints imposed by what's known as the TUPI regulations, which largely guarantee that staff moving from their old employer to the new one are protected. However, academies can set their own pay levels for newly recruited staff. Well, I mean, the TUPI restrictions are, are, are really important to, to, to bear in mind. I have to be quite careful that, that anything that I do, I have to put through the filter of saying, is this a measure under TUPI? Because I need to be very, very clear that I'm not changing things for the staff. However, in the future, obviously, there are flexibilities that, uh, that, that one can avail oneself of. But at the moment, what I want is I want to keep an excellent staff, and I want to keep an excellent staff as happy as I can. The Academy Trust that's set up when schools make the conversion is technically a charitable company limited by guarantee. This places legal obligations on the governors, which are similar to those on directors of any other company. Company directors are personally liable if that company continues to trade when it's insolvent. Because many local authority pension schemes are in deficit, many school governors are concerned about their liabilities if they change to become an academy. Now, what about pensions? I know there's no change for, for teachers, but for support staff there is a, a concern about what happens to the pensions liability. What is their position? Yeah, the, well, the local government pension scheme um, deficit is one of the issues that I know that worries a lot, of, a lot of schools. The advice is that before a school converts, you have an actuarial assessment of the deficit for your particular school. The, the actuarial assessment will give you um, an employer's contribution so that over the next 20 years, that deficit is reduced to zero. Um, the deficit sits on the Academy's books, but there is an agreement between the DfE and the Charity Commission that you will not be a company trading whilst insolvent. But it will sit there, and it obviously looks a bit ugly. The school, along with other Academies, has also received an undertaking in a letter from the Minister, Lord Hill, that if the deficit is called in, then the Department for Education will make a grant to cover the costs. The new Academy's programme is a step change from the one created by the last government, which focused on a relatively small number of underperforming or even failing schools. Potentially the new programme could extend to the great majority of schools, and that would mean big changes for local authorities. As you're probably aware, some people are, have raised concerns about what it means for those schools that are left behind still with the local authority, particularly if, if schools like your own, which may not have a big call on some things like special needs or behavioural support. Uh, what's your response to that? I, I think it is, a, it is a concern. What I do have to say is, though, that we've been being tithed for a number of years and not receiving, um, not receiving anything like the same uh, amount of services back as, as we've been paying for. So uh, it is a, we, we have been subsidising the system for a number of years. What if some other event uh, overtook the school, for example, a fire burnt yeah. down your, your buildings? Um, in, the, in the past, the local authority would be there as backup and support, might mm -hmm. find alternative accommodation while the mm -hmm. school is rebuilt. Mm -hmm. What would happen uh, now you're an academy? Well, it's a, that's an interesting area. Um, I mean, I hope we don't prove to be a test case, uh, but, but eventually there's going to be one. 
Um, and the local authorities still have a responsibility to make sure that, that students are, are educated. We have to take out insurance and we have to make sure that our insurance is, is adequate. But at the moment, I couldn't tell you where the funding stream is that I would la tap into to have that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, replacement. That there are clearly some things that you need a local body to be in charge of, special needs um, funding, exclusions, um, what happens if a school burns down. So my view is that the model that whereby 100% of funding is being devolved to schools is not quite the right model. They need to change that and devolve 95% or 98% or whatever it may be. Beyond that, I, I've never been clear what this amazing array of services that everyone talks about is. The stated £250,000 that this one school would get extra per year we do not receive £250,000 worth of, of services from the local authority. We don't end of. I know that not everybody thinks very highly of everything that the local authority does. I, re I recognise that. There are you know, good local authorities and not so good. But the, the local authority system is what needs, I think, to be protected. If it accelerates, and if we have all schools becoming academies, then my, my forecast is that after a while, 20,000 schools answerable to the Secretary of State won't work. So the schools will voluntarily cluster together into consortia and organise things like procurement of services through consortia and that will be, need to be paid for. And before long you will actually recreate a kind of pseudo-local authority but without the democratic input. And that, that, is, that is my nightmare scenario. There are risks involved in the academy's policy and one of those is that, that perhaps unintentionally there could be greater power moving to the centre with the Secretary of State directly responsible for hundreds, even thousands of schools. But ministers say that's not their intention. They hope that greater autonomy for schools and greater competition between them will help raise standards generally. In the next Need to Know, we're at Westminster for the announcement of the Comprehensive Spending Review when we'll be finding out what lies ahead for school funding.